The Scarlet King Item Number SCP-001 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Following the recent investigations of Dr. Robert Montauk, no action is currently needed to contain SCP-001. It is functionally self-containing, and any Foundation interference may harm or alter its containment irreversibly. No Foundation personnel are to engage with any new matters related to SCP-001, with the exception of related anomalies already in Foundation containment. Description SCP-001 is an entity ordinarily referred to as the Scarlet King. SCP-001 is currently located in several alternate dimensions simultaneously and is unable to enter the Prime Dimension. However, it is believed to have been repeatedly attempting entry for a period of under 300 years. SCP-001's physical, mental, and conceptual properties are unknown to the Foundation. Nevertheless, it continues to assert a strong influence on a number of individuals and events within the Prime Dimension. It is believed that SCP-001's existence represents an ongoing but dormant Tashkent-class cross-pollination scenario. Footnote, a K-class scenario wherein the imminent alteration of reality or eradication of all human life is caused by the interaction between two anomalous objects of a radically different type. Should SCP-001 enter the Prime Timeline, an irreparable alteration to normalcy will occur. Containment of SCP-001 is, however, unnecessary. Any attempt to alter SCP-001's classification or object class will result in immediate dismissal from the O5 Council. References in art and oral tradition to SCP-001 appear across a wide variety of human and non-human cultures across the universe, including in communities which have never previously had any contact with one another. Common descriptions within these traditions are of a red creature of immense size, ordinarily wearing a golden crown or other headdress signifying royalty. Although the names ascribed to SCP-001 vary, the majority contain two elements, a word signifying some form of royalty, combined with a word signifying the color red. Cultures which do not have a concept of the color red but follow this naming pattern universally use a color analogous to the English concept of the color red. Most personnel, except those working on anomalies related to SCP-001, possess no knowledge of the entity. As part of SCP-2317's containment procedures, Level 4 personnel, footnote, with the exception of Dr. Robert Montauk, project lead on SCP-001, SCP-231, and SCP-2317, are to be informed that SCP-2317 is, in fact, SCP-001. The truth of this is unknown, although it is a hypothesis which has received strong support among several members of the Council. The apparently multidimensional nature of SCP-001, however, renders the possibility of SCP-2317 being anything more than a single aspect of SCP-001 unlikely. It is unknown when SCP-001 was discovered. The loss of several archives containing the Foundation's origins in the 1889 snarling coup has prevented a full reconstruction of events, although an investigation shortly following data expunged. A variety of groups dedicated to bringing SCP-001 into the Prime Dimension have existed over the years. The most recent of these has been the Children of the Scarlet King, which was destroyed in a joint GOC-SCP operation in January 2018. Its former leader, Depeche Spivak, is currently in Foundation custody under the designation POI-3172. Update. June 1st, 2018. SCP-001 has recently been the subject of an extensive investigation by Dr. Robert Montauk, project lead on SCP-001, SCP-231, and SCP-2317, and divisor of Procedure 110 Montauk. Based on the results of this investigation, SCP-001 has been downgraded to safe following a decision taken by the O5 Council. Upon the request of the former O513, a number of documents related to this investigation can be found below in order to provide context and further information pertaining to this theory. These have been curated, categorized, and included by the former O513 herself with the permission of O51 in order to provide some context to this reevaluation. Phase 1 Blood Document 1 The following is an interview between Dr. Robert Montauk and POI 3172. Date April 1st, 2018. Interviewer, Dr. Robert Montauk. Interviewee, POI-3172. Location, Site-713. Interview Room 2. Begin Log. POI-3172. Again, Dr. Montauk? I don't understand what you people want from me. Dr. Montauk. Hello to you too, Depeche. I'm sorry to do this to you again. I think it's silly too, to be honest. 
What we want from you are answers. POI 3172. It's been, what, weeks? Months? You've dragged me down here into one of your interview rooms, asked me these endless questions. You are one of your lackeys. Dr. Montauk. I'm sorry if you've been made to feel uncomfortable. It wasn't my intention, but it's hard to keep tabs on everything anymore. Have the guards been treating you badly in any way? POI 3172. No? No, not really. I can't really complain. It's just their eyes. They look so dead. So cold. Dr. Montauk. If you like, I can rearrange some personnel and put someone else on your security detail. We're a bit short-staffed around here at the moment, and a lot of our best folks are away. And then there's the paperwork and the endless oversight. There's been some trouble with... Well, you don't need to know about that. POI 3172. You weren't what I expected, you know. Dr. Montauk. You thought the Foundation would be different. POI 3172. No. I thought you would be. Dr. Montauk. You'd heard of me. POI 3172. Of what you've done. Procedure 110 Montauk. Well. The people in my circles have done some dark things in their time, but that... Dr. Montauk. I merely did what was necessary, Mr. Spivak. As a Foundation researcher and as someone who doesn't want to see his loved ones die. POI 3172. Yes. That's very like the Foundation, isn't it? Everything done is justified by what is necessary. You see the world, the people moving through it, living lives touched only by totalizing universal laws of society and physics, and everything has to be channeled through those laws, and that which lies outside it is to be contained. It's all so very simple. Dr. Montauk, you wouldn't say that if you worked here. POI 3172. Some of us called you evil. I don't think that's quite it. Dr. Montauk. That is kind of you to say. And to tell you the truth, I don't think you're quite what I expected either, especially given your reputation. POI 3172. I've been told I am a hard person to get along with. Too cryptic, they say. One person even called me Airy. Dr. Montauk. I don't think I'd call you Airy. Your head may be in the clouds, but you seem to be maddeningly smug about it. Granted, not as smug as some of the delusional cultists who have passed through here. I suppose I should be thankful for that, at least. POI 3172. I'll try not to take that as an insult. But this is what I don't understand. Your procedure. 110 Montauk. It's not. Dr. Montauk. I can't discuss that, I'm afraid. We must get on. Time and tide and all that rubbish. Please tell me what the children of the Scarlet King's overall intention was. POI 3172. The children are dead. There's not much left to tell you. Dr. Montauk. I would like to hear things in your own words. POI 3172. Then I suppose you could say that our intention was to save the world. Dr. Montauk. And how are you planning to go about doing that? POI 3172. By bringing the Scarlet King into this reality, of course. You know this already. Dr. Montauk. But how would that save the world? POI 3172. Doctor, is this really necessary? You took away his daughters years ago and ended up killing most of them. You have already annihilated our society, and I'm sure you know all about what went on within it. We worshipped the king, pretending he was Satan or some other ancient god of evil. Our inner circle believed in violation as the ultimate holy act. We failed. You and the book burners destroyed us. And the matter has been put to rest. Dr. Montauk. You seem awfully calm while describing the destruction of your life's work. POI 3172. What else can I do? I know how this is going to play out. Maybe I always did. Dr. Montauk. Why do you refer to the Global Occult Coalition as the book burners? Were you and your group affiliated with the Serpent's Hand? POI 3172. That... that's... it's complicated. Dr. Montauk. It's a simple enough question. POI 3172. But there isn't a simple answer. Still... Yes. Yes, we were affiliated with the Serpent's Hand. Most of us passed through there at one time or another. They will disavow us, of course, if you ask them about us. They're not monsters like we are. They have moral precepts, you see. Their whole point is to look for wonder, and since they see no wonder in the king, they repudiate us utterly. But they know deep down that they need us. Dr. Montauk. They need you? What for? POI 3172. For the same reason they let us live. We raided the library, fought them, skirmished with them. They had a huge quantity of dirt on us, far more than you do. But they never finished the job. They're as bad as you jailers in their own way. The same compartmentalization, the same singular goals. Their existence is based in nothing concrete. The empty time of history, that's all. Indeed, they came into being at the same time as you. You're more similar than you realize. 
Dr. Montauk. That's impossible. The Serpent's Hand has been documented as existing long before the Foundation and any Encarn. POI-3172. No, no, you missed the point. The library's always been there, yes, but not the Hand. The Hand was something new, like you all are. You think anybody ever cared about wonder in the old days? Nobody cared about wonder. They cared about food, family, and blood. Dr. Montauk. What's that supposed to mean? POI-3172. It means... Uh, you wouldn't get it anyway, but the Hand would. I think even the book burners do in their own way, but the hand is scared. They try to blot us out, forget us. We are what they should be, but never can be, you see. Dr. Montauk. Look, Depeche, I've tried to make things more comfortable for you, but we need some give and take. You're speaking in cliched, cryptic riddles, and I want some answers. POI 3172. I can't tell you everything. You wouldn't treat the information properly. You'd treat it as scientific fact, something to be swallowed, understood, contextualized. Dr. Montauk. And what is wrong with that? POI-3172. Why are you doing this, Doctor? Why are you dredging this stuff up again? Dr. Montauk. I shouldn't tell you, but... Ah, screw it. I'm tired of this. I've been working on SCP-001 for two decades. Project lead for almost nine years after I came up with the procedure. I don't know. I'm tired. Everywhere I turn, I see the Scarlet King, but nothing about him makes any sense. Some big-horned devil? Arcane blood god? It's all so small, so obvious. The Foundation has changed in the last decade, you see. We faced conceptual demons, malevolent genre dwellers, sevenfold destroyers, all of which are far worse than some old sacrifice deity. But there, behind everything, I see this smile and fire. That dread, that old dread, it lingers. And this is despite seeing horrors far less easy and far more subtle trying to break the world on a daily basis. I just want to understand, I suppose. Peel back the layers, the tales upon contradictory tales, and find out who he really is. POI-3172 You are being awfully candid, Dr. Montauk. To be honest, I've stopped caring. This job gets to you. The things you have to do, the regrets. Well, I'm too high up for anybody to touch me now, and I've run into too many dead ends to get hung up over protocol by this point. Just tell me something, Depeche. Anything. POI-3172 Okay. Look. I like you, Montauk. You must be a cold-blooded bastard somewhere in there, or you wouldn't have come up with... Well, who am I to judge, eh? I'll tell you where to start. Dr. Montauk. I'm all ears. POI-3172. There are three things to understand about the Scarlet King. Three laws which, when put together, make up a complete picture. One is the law of blood, one is the law of concrete, and one is the law of howling. Dr. Montauk. Three laws, eh? that the king set down for his followers, or that were imposed upon him. POI-3172. Both. The first was his law, the second was somebody else's. And as for the third, well, you'll find out about the third when you've cracked the first two. Dr. Montauk. Very cryptic. POI-3172. That's all I can tell you for now. You need to learn in the proper way. Dr. Montauk. That's really all you'll give. POI-3172. That's all. There is a pause for several seconds. Dr. Montauk. All right, Depeche. Good talking with you, as ever. End log. Document 2. The following is an extract from the memories of one Jack Hurst, a defector from the Children of the Scarlet King. Hurst was a high-level reality bender, capable of entering the bodies of humans in the past and experiencing their thoughts and emotions firsthand. The following is a description of what Hurst called the Battle of the Gemaleth, purportedly a battle between SCP-001 and his followers against a group called the Children of the Urns. Hurst apparently experienced the battle from the perspective of a foot soldier in SCP-001's army. These memoirs were written shortly before Hurst's death in 1976. They were among the first documents consulted by Dr. Montauk during his investigation. The fortress was monumental, made of volcanic rock and jagged iron, and built into a vast mountain. Every measurement, every angle was calculated to promote the king's ideology. The steel slats and bars may have seemed to be jutting out in random half-sawn directions, but if you could see the whole, then you'd see the symmetry. It was a perfect expression of cosmic order, expressed in endless sevens. It's a tough trip to remember, but bits and pieces come back. We were slaves, I think. We'd been taken from a far-off land. The nobility looked down upon us with cruel eyes, but the king didn't care. He rewarded us, and so we were the instruments of his rule. When a village required the justice of the king, we would descend upon them with blood and iron. The villagers feared us, and that felt right to me. 
but when the horde came with fire and burning into their cries of freedom, the villagers were still just as scared as they had been of us. That was not the fear of their master, I think, but the fear of anarchy. They didn't know which way to turn. In the end, most betrayed us. Many had had their daughters taken by our master. Old rights, blood rights, arcane rights. But we stood upon the battlements loyal to the last, our hearts bursting with happiness at the rightness of it all. I'm still not sure exactly what was going on. It was all so chaotic and full of red smoke, but I could feel my host's bloodlust. We stood, and watched, and waited. The sound of rubble and explosions came from across the hill, and the last battle begun. Then something strange happened. My host suddenly felt afraid, and he and I were somewhere else. The sky was not red, but black. I was not a slave, but part of a conscripted rabble. The peasants looked up at us. They were all starving. They held out their hands, begging, pleading, praying. The wind was their master and it screamed at them. The horde was coming, but they too were starving. Then the scene flickered back and I was in my host again under a scarlet sky. The king's voice raged. The rabble of his armies was fleeing to the gates, but they would not open. Our arrows, coated in flame and pitch, flew back again, but the horde was undaunted. In my mind, I could see nothing but the fire, the fire of the king. I drew my sword. We all drew our swords. We all charged into the fray. And then, as it were, the scene changed again. There were no battlements, only the dark sky and the wind, and a more ragged and lonely sky. The peasants pleaded, the nomads laughed, cheered, wept. The wind will rage no more, they said. The two scenes shifted in and out. A red fort bled into a black field. I have ruminated on it a long time, but I think they were the same battle seen through two different eyes, or at least the memories of two different battles. The whole thing felt strange. It was not like most of my trips. It was like a half-remembered cacophony, two ideas ripping at each other. There was a timeline showing what really happened in that blackened wasteland, and there was one that had been made to be true in posts throughout time on truth. The last thing I remember was being sliced by a nomad sword, of a frail urn being held high, of seven brides being ripped from a castle. Or were they ripped from a field, taken as the spoils of war by some obscure tribe in some lost steppe? I remember the king screaming, writhing, thrashing as he was sealed. And then I died, and woke up back at the ritual. For a second, I wondered if the others had just made up the king, and sent some image of him back to the past. But I don't think that was true. They lacked the power. And besides, it was never a total lie. There was something in that wicked wind that reminded me of some of the older rituals. It was then that I decided to leave the children. I went that night without a word. They didn't stop me. Probably figured it wasn't worth the effort. They were so certain in the success of their mission, but I wanted no part in that anymore. The things I saw were based upon the law of blood, and I can only pray that they never come to pass. Document 3. The following is a log of all known attempts by anomalous groups to force SCP-001's entry into the Prime Dimension since the containment of SCP-231. Date. March 1st, 2009. Group of Interest. Provisional Children of the Scarlet King. Details of Attempt. Summoning attempt was performed by the ritual of smearing of blood, and then the destruction of rubble recovered from the demolition of the Cochrane Gardens Housing Project Complex in St. Louis, Missouri. It is believed that the children of the Scarlet King manipulated state officials into the demolition over the course of several years, and that this splinter group continued their work as the original children went into decline. Result. Attempt prevented by a Foundation raid. Date. May 12, 2012. Group of Interest. Red Guards. Details of Attempt appeared to be using the blood, bones, and spinal fluid of several animals, combined with ritual chanting, to create a portal to SCP-001. A large number of SCP Foundation logos, carved out of bone, were placed around the ritual site in a defensive position. These logos were slightly incorrectly carved. Result. Attempt not detected by any GOI, and came extremely close to success. However, it appears a critical mistake in the words of the ritual instead resulted in a large explosive blast destroyed all of the assembled members of the guards. It remains unknown why the guards apparently wished to invoke Foundation protection for their ceremony. Date: July 2nd, 2014. Group of Interest. Global Occult Coalition. Details of Attempt. Unknown. Result. Unknown, but did not succeed. GOC records pertaining to the incident are missing, with the exception of the name Operation Historical Frontier, with the mission statement to exacerbate tensions of historical time in order to bring forth and destroy a significant occult threat. It is believed that several GOC operatives were killed in the attempt. Date: January 1st, 17. Group of Interest, Army of the New Dawn. 
Details of attempt. Attempt involved the ritual burning of several calendars adhering to the Gregorian calendar, while members of the group raised up blood-soaked calendars adhering to the Julian, Hijri, and Persian solar systems to an effigy of SCP-001. Result. Attempt prevented by members of the Serpent's Hand. All materials were recovered and taken to the Wanderer's Library. Date. September 17th, 2017. Group of Interest. The Serpent's Hand. Details of Attempt. Largely unknown. Details are unclear, but it is believed it involved the highly selective destruction of particular books within the Wanderer's Library. Result. Attempt was purportedly foiled due to a schism in the group. The resulting casualties severely damaged the library, 